Shalom, shalom. It's great to be here once again as we come together to welcome more of the Word of God into our lives so that we can grow, to know, to honor, to love, and be obedient to the Lord. Have you ever heard the expression, rules are meant to be broken? It was coined by five-star General Douglas MacArthur, who himself broke many rules during the Korean War and eventually had to resign his post. So the question is, is it always bad to break rules? Well, it all depends. Think about Rosa Parks. Back in the 50s, she refused to get up off her seat for a white man and go to the back of the bus. She broke the rules. But this eventually led to the Civil Act of 1964, bringing legal segregation to a halt in the United States. So breaking that rule brought great social and political changes. You know, sometimes it takes tremendous courage and deep conviction to break man-made rules. But it often takes so much more courage and conviction and faith not to break the rules of God. Men's rules are made by men and evolve according to time, circumstances, and social persuasions. But as believers in God, how are we to look at God's rules? Are some meant to be broken or changed over time? Some might argue that certain biblical rules should be understood only in their cultural context, meaning that those rules were relevant only for that period of time. Think about men having long hair, or women wearing a head covering, or speaking out in the congregation. These are considered by many Christian communities today as outdated. But we know that there are certain divine rules and principles, laws which must not be broken. Why? Because God's nature does not change, and neither does the heart of man. Maintaining an intimate friendship with God depends on unbreakable rules such as these. Love God. Love your neighbor. Be holy. Forgive. Repent. Confess. Don't lie. Steal or murder. Worship God alone. These are all rules that regardless of the dispensation we live in, regardless of the language we speak or the country that we call home, these must not be broken. And Yeshua was a rule follower, wasn't he? He willingly put himself under the discipline and rules of Torah. Growing up, he put himself not only under the authority of God, coming to him morning by morning, boker by boker, to learn from his father according to Isaiah chapter 50, but he also willingly came under the authority of his earthly parents. Luke chapter 2 verse 51 says, And he went down with them, that is his parents, and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. No doubt he obeyed the social norms, rules, and customs of the day, probably attending school in Nazareth as well as attending synagogue. Luke confirms his obedience by declaring that he grew up in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. And one of the disciplines or rules which Yeshua followed and taught us to do is the practice of prayer. This is a rule that must remain unbroken and unchallenged. And at a future session together, we're going to review the purposes and benefits of prayer. But for today, I would like to highlight the parable from Luke chapter 18, where Yeshua teaches the believer two very important points when it comes to prayer. Not only should we be praying persistently, but it is also what we are praying about persistently that becomes very relevant. Was there something specific that Yeshua had in mind for us about the way we are to fervently pray? So then we go to the parable of Luke chapter 18, and it goes like this. We have a widow who is speaking, which is, excuse me, a widow who is seeking her rights against her adversary. She knocks persistently on the door of the unjust judge until he finally gives her the justice that she was seeking. Now, we could at this point easily leave the parable concluding that the persistence in prayer pays off, and that's great. It's a great message. But might Yeshua be showing us something even more? Once the story of the widow concludes, listen well to what Yeshua has to say. And we read this from verse 7. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? In this verse, there are actually two groups of people who are being addressed. First, we have group number one, 
These are the elect. And so it says that God will bring justice to the elect, to, to the believers who are to be crying out to him day and night. Unlike the unjust judge, our God will vindicate the elect in his perfect timing. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And now we come to the second group in this verse. Who might these be? The ones whom the Lord will long delay. Now that word delay is the Greek word macrothemia, and it means his anger is from a distance. That means that God is long-suffering, and he is not judging these individuals of the second group just yet. In this second group, we have those who will come to believe one day, and the Lord is waiting so patiently for their salvation. They are what we can call the elect in waiting, who Peter spoke about when he wrote in 2 Peter, 5, 2 Peter 3, 15, Consider the macrothumio of the Lord as salvation. This points to the compassion, the long-suffering, the long delay of the Lord as he waits patiently for the elect in waiting. So is there a connection between these two groups, the elect, who are commanded to pray day and night, and those who are still in their unsaved state? So to help answer this question, let's look at the parable's location. Remember we learned last time, location, location pl plays a very important role. The parable is found in the start of chapter 18, right? The parable of the persistent widow. But let's just look a little bit further behind in, in chapter 17. And in chapter 17, we see the Pharisees are asking Yeshua about the coming kingdom. And while Yeshua does say that the kingdom is in their midst, he then turns to his own disciples and he adds some very important aspects of the kingdom. He refers to his second coming. He refers to the millennium and he refers to the rapture, which are all part of God's plan. In fact, in chapter 17 alone, we have the term son of man mentioned six times, which brings the Jewish hearer to think about the Messiah and his coming. Then we enter chapter 18 and we read about the persistent widow. And right at the end of the parable, Yeshua finishes off with this statement. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So this is found at the end of the parable. We have a reference once again to the second coming of Yeshua, who is looking for anyone who might be left after the tribulation. He is looking for the faithful ones, the elect to be, that second group of people for whom he is long-suffering. But there won't be many found, unfortunately. And we understand that question because it says, will he find faith on the earth? But this shouldn't surprise us that there are few to be found. You know, we consider the three, estimated the three billion people in Noah's day. How many were saved in that day? Eight out of all that. And only half the amount were saved in Sodom and Gomorrah. However few or however many, these are the elect that the Lord is waiting for. These are the elect that will enter into the millennial kingdom. These are the ones that he is long-suffering for. And these are the ones that we, the elect, are to be praying for. Do we see the connection between the two groups? Yeshua is asking us, the elect, to be fervent and persistent in prayer for the unsaved. When we give out Bibles door-to-door -door or in shopping malls, we have the hopes that Jewish people, as well as Gentiles, will come to faith now. But we are also praying that seeds that are planted today will have a future effect in those dark tribulation days, when they will be seeking the Lord and be found with faith at the end upon His return. We say that even if they take the Bibles and they put them into their drawers today in their homes, let them find it later, but let them have it in their homes. So how are we, the elect, praying? Are we persistent in our daily prayers? Are we crying day and night for the soon return of the Messiah, for the establishment of the Messianic Kingdom, realizing God's global plan for this 2,000-year delay is not procrastination, but rather it's that souls would be prevented from being lost eternally. Do you see the compassion of God and our responsibility in this? And you know, just as the martyred saints in heaven will be praying for the vindication of those who are suffering during the tribulation, so we need to be persistent and disciplined to pray for those who are lost. 
And notice something very interesting in the formula of the Lord's Prayer. What are we first praying for? His kingdom come and his will be done? That should be our first and utmost desire, the longing to see his soon return. By praying that first, <laughs> we take the focus off ourselves, don't we? And we point to God's fuller purpose to see people being saved in Yeshua, to see his righteousness being rever revealed. God's first purpose and plan then comes our daily bread. Are rules meant to be broken? Not when it comes to prayer. Let's stick by the rules of how to pray and what to pray for, and our lives will be truly blessed. You know, sometimes we really lose out when we break the rules. In 1980, a woman by the name of Rosie Ruiz entered the Boston Marathon along with everybody else. However, at some point in the race, she withdrew into the sidelines. She disappeared and apparently took a metro across town, re-entered the race at the finish line. Well, closer, before the finish line. She won, but not for long. Eight days later, her broken rules were discovered and her medal was taken away. Some rules just cannot be broken, like our responsibility to pray. You know, our running this race in this life needs to be for the glory of God and for His sovereign will first and foremost, or we are running the wrong race and we are running in the wrong direction. We need to see set our eyes on the great reward, looking unto Yeshua, the author and finisher of our faith, who is waiting for us at the finish line. General MacArthur did not get away with breaking the rules when he stood up against the authority of the President of the United States. May we never undermine the golden rules, the laws to love and be obedient to the King of Eternity. May we please the Father's heart in our persistence in praying for the lost. Be blessed in Messiah, and I'll see you very soon. Shalom, shalom. <music>